menerapkan perdami virtual meeting, maka kami tidak mungkin mengadakan kuliah terbuka ini di akhir bulan ini karena khawatir melanggar aturan dari uh, perdami bahwa paling tidak satu bulan sebelum acara perdami virtual meeting tidak boleh ada lagi acara webinar atau yang sejenisnya. Sehingga kami adakan tanggal ini 18 Agustus mudah-mudahan masih belum me, masih bisa sesuai dengan aturan dari PP Perdami karena acara dari Perdami Virtual Meeting itu akan dimulai tanggal 18 September. Nah, mudah-mudahan eh, dokter-dokter sekalian yang hadir pada hari ini bisa mengambil manfaat dari kuliah beliau. Eh, kita mudah-mudahan bisa mengaplikasikannya dalam eh, apa pelayanan kita sehari-hari. Saya sangat berharap eh, bisa lebih banyak lagi eh, PPDS yang bisa ikut, juga dokter-dokter mata, karena memang eh, terabekulektomi ini adalah ilmu yang sangat eh, bermanfaat dan kemudian juga bisa diaplikasikan eh, karena merupakan bagian dari keterampilan dasar eh, seorang dokter mata dalam prakteknya sehari-hari. Eh, baiklah, kita akan mulai eh, kuliah beliau. Uh, uh, I will. I think um, you, you all know about Professor Bill Morgan. He was. Uh, he is actually uh, the now is still the director of Lions Eye Institute, Prof. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Professor Bill Morgan is now is uh, the director of Lions Eye Institute in Perth, uh, Western Australia, and now he will give a talk about trabeculectomy. Uh, so, Professor Bill Morgan, I give. Uh, your uh, the time for yours thank you thank you now um i just have to how do i the share screen it is in the in front the, the in the oh, bottom share screen down there yes. sorry yes. Yeah. yes sorry about that um you can tell i'm not here we go and here we are and the full screen bro. Ah, is that okay can you see yes. me now it's very good yes <coughs> Yes, thank so, you. Verna, thank you. And thank you to the Indonesian Glaucoma Society for asking me to talk all about trabeculectomy. Now, in some ways, I feel a little bit of a fraud as I think that probably a lot of you do more trabeculectomies than I do. So I think in this talk, I'm going to show you simply what my technique is and also a little bit about the history but at any time, please feel free to ask questions or comment or something like that if you would like to. So just a little bit about the history, and I won't read all of this, but essentially the first ever glaucoma operation was described in 1830. So that's almost 200 years ago. Uh, and essentially it was noted that a knife should pass close to the limbus into the anterior chamber and then some drainage may or may not result and that it was very risky and bleeding was often often occurred so that was probably an injury to the ciliary body the first uh, proper well described glaucoma operation was actually described by albrecht von grafe the very famous german ophthalmologist back in 1856, who first described iridectomy, which, as you know, is really for uh, angle closure. But he did notice, and in those days, they used a limbal incision, cut the iridectomy. He did notice that in some patients, a cystoid scar, almost certainly a bleb, was created, and that that was advantageous. Those patients did quite well. So that was probably the first production or description of a drainage bleb associated with an iridectomy. The, now I haven't got the date here, but in about 1890 to 1900, De Wecker and Holf, who I think were from Norway, described a full thickness sclerostomy at the limbus going through into the anterior chamber. So that was, that became sclerectomy, the standard operation for for quite some years. Uh, it was modified by Soren Holf from Norway in 1904, so 100 years ago, to deliberately include some iris into that sclerotomy. 
and that was called iridin clysis. <clears throat> that was actually a standard operation for about 60 years. I still see the occasional patient who has had an iridin clysis, although they're getting old now. And that was, it did work. Uh, the iris acted to keep that sclerostomy open. Um, but again, the operation was prone to complications, in particular, prone to hypotony and all the hypotonous complications. There was a variation on full thickness sclerostomy by the American Harold Shea, 1958, basically cauterizing the wound to try and keep that hole through the sclera larger and more open. Uh, finally, trabeculectomy was first described by Watson and Cairns in the United Kingdom, 1968. Now, the original idea was to uh, dissect through the sclera using a scleral flap down onto the trabecular meshwork and excise some trabecular meshwork over the scleral, uh, the canal of Schlem, so that you would then theoretically get drainage from the anterior chamber into the canal of Schlem through that gap which bypassed the trabecular meshwork. Now, what happened was that uh, the ones that worked all produced blebs and it was noted that the scleral flap was advantageous because it reduced the amount of hypotony and, and the complications. So trabeculectomy retained the name which basically means removal of trabecular meshwork, but its physiology or the way it works changed. And it was then altered to deliberately produce a drainage bleb using the scleral flap as a way of minimizing low pressure complications. So what, why do we do a trabeculectomy? Basically, we usually do a trabeculectomy when there was continuing visual field loss and or optic nerve or optic disc tissue loss from glaucoma, usually in spite of maximal medical treatment, when we've considered appropriate laser treatment if necessary, and when the patient understands all of the risks, uh, so with informed consent. And this is a pretty typical example, a patient I saw actually on Monday and you can see the visual fields from 2010, 11, that's an artifact. And then just in the last 12 months, he's, he's developed a superior nasal step defect. And if you look at the optic disc, this is a reflectance image from the Heidelberg retinal tomograph. So look at this first, I'm going to flicker back and forth. I don't know if the flicker comes through, but here, you'll just see a small notch developing as we go from 2010, which is this image, to 2020. And you'll also notice that the subtraction analysis detects a significant change in this region of the optic disc. You'll also see a nerve fiber layer defect, and that's produced that superior nasal step defect here. And so that patient has clearly progressed. They've got pseudo exfoliation with a pressure that's gone up from 16 to 24 in the last year. And they're already on all the drops that we have available. So maximal treatment. So this is pretty much a typical patient who requires a trabeculectomy. Um, so I just, I try and tell patients these things when I'm doing a trabeculectomy, most importantly, that the surgery will not improve their vision. It will only stabilize it or at best slow down the disease. That 13% of patients will notice some slight blurring or moderate blurring of the vision. The, the clarity of vision won't be quite as good after the surgery as it was beforehand that there's one in 500 or one in a thousand chance of blindness from either a hemorrhage or infection. And that the eye may not feel the same. The bleb may create a gritty sensation, what we call bleb dysesthesia. 
uh, and that there's about a 95% chance we will very significantly reduce the pressure, but there is a chance of failure, which is probably about 5% in the first year that the trabeculectomy will fail. And that also the visual benefit will probably take some years. So uh, initially they'll notice possibly some blurring of vision and, but the vision generally will be more stable. And then if what will happen is that if they had not had the surgery within probably six months or a year, the vision will have been, have become worse than it is after they've had trabeculectomy. So there's a sort of uh, payoff, uh, but it's down the track. It's probably six months, 12 months later. So what pressure do we aim for? Now, by the time someone is going to have trabeculectomy, usually they've got moderate to severe glaucoma. And usually we're wanting a pressure between 10 and 15, particularly lower pressure if they've lost a lot of visual field and optic disc tissue. Now we don't want the pressure to be too low. We don't, ideally, we don't want it below six millimeters of mercury, especially if they're a high myope sometimes even below eight or 10 is a problem. Um, so if they are a high myope, you have to be careful uh, how low you go. And there's probably a reason to use more releasable stitches to try and control that pressure post-operatively. Now, should you use mitomycin C? Mostly yes, I think, especially in Indonesia where your patients tend to scar more than patients who are Caucasian, who are the majority of our patients here in Australia. Um, so yes, generally use mitomycin C if you can obtain it. And then you can use 5-fluorouracil, uh, which can be given uh, post-operatively as well. Now, these other groups are the ones who are more likely to fail or scar, and so they should definitely be given mitomycin C. So that's people who are young. Uh, particular risk factors like patients who've had previous cataract surgery, uh, multiple other eye operations, if they've had multiple eye drops that they've been on, uh, if they have a uveitis, if they have chronic or severe uveitis or frequent bouts of uveitis, then I think you should use the Verna GDD. Don't even try to do a trabeculectomy. Uh, now, if the patient's very old or if they're immunosuppressed, you might decide not to use mitomycin C, perhaps just use some 5-fluorouracil, but that's a decision you have to make when you consider everything. So that's what you look at in terms of the history. What about some signs at, at surgery, before surgery rather? So always check the angle. And if the patient has got a narrow angle, particularly if they have ciliary block, then that's a red flag. And that's quite dangerous for doing just a trabeculectomy. And you should really consider either first removing the lens and letting the eye settle down or combining the surgery, the trabeculectomy with a cataract extraction. Also, if the patient has a cataract, a trabeculectomy almost always makes that worse. So you might consider moving the, removing the cataract first, letting the eye settle down after, uh, if you can control the pressure and then doing the trabeculectomy. Always, always check the conjunctiva so that you prepared for what area of the eye. So is it going to be supranasal or uh, supratemporal, for example? Whereabouts does the conjunctiva look most healthy so that you ideally get the best outcome and the surgery is the easiest? And then finally, is the patient on any anticoagulants that might make them bleed during surgery? like warfarin or some of the other agents. If they are, you, you have to stop them. So let's talk about trabeculectomy. 
the anesthesia, I think pretty much everyone where you are uses local anesthesia. And I do mostly as well, use a subconjunctival um, injection. It's very safe. Um, and very rarely do we use a general anesthetic. And I talk about the steps, um, 10 steps, um, sort of a bit like the 10 commandments from the old, what we would call the Old Testament. <laughs> but, um, so fixating the eye, conjunctival incision, diathermy of the scleral flap, using the antimitotic, cutting the actual scleral flap, uh, a paracentesis so you can inject fluid, cutting the actual ostomy and then the iridectomy, suturing the flap and closing the conjunctiva with the end result being to create a shortcut for aqueous humor to get out of the eye and into that subconjunctival space. So it bypasses all of the usual outflow system and so reduces the pressure. So let's have a look. This is the a typical subconjunctival anesthetic going in. This patient um, was the one I did late last week, actually. This is fixating the eye. Uh, I use a, um, a braided Dacron or sometimes a Vicryl or a silk suture. The main thing is to use a, a suture that's got a spatulated needle so it'll go through the cornea cleanly. Um, and just be careful not to perforate the cornea, otherwise you get a leak and then the eye goes soft and it makes it a lot more difficult uh, to do the uh, cut the scleral flap, for example. Now I try not to grab the conjunctiva. Here you can see just me touching the conjunctiva, giving counter pressure has caused a little hemorrhage. So it will often in old people, it, the conjunctiva is quite fragile. Now this is the conjunctival incision. I use a limbal based flap. Many of you will use a fornix based flap. It's really personal preference. I'll show you some data on that. Uh, the reason that I use a limbal based flap is that it's very rare to get a leak and it reduces the rate of the risk of low pressure and hypotenuse complications. So this is a very typical, and I'm blunt dissecting the tissue up to the limbus. So then I can get a view of the limbus, makes it easier to do the, thanks, the, um, the, the um, diathermy to outline the scleral flap. So this is outlining the scleral flap with diathermy. And I make the flap a little bit longer than it is wide, probably three and a half millimeters wide by about four and a half millimeters long. So I've outlined the flap there and I only burn or diathermy where I'm going to cut. I don't, the more burning you do, the more scarring you'll induce. So only, only burn where you're going to cut. Don't, you don't need to diathermy the entire region. The, um, now here, this is the time I use the mitomycin C. So I put mitomycin C in that posterior part of the wound and you can use different doses. I just tend to use 0.3 milligrams per mil for about three minutes. I have used fifluorouracil for five minutes, but certainly the mitomycin C is more potent. And you can see it's been soaked in uh, pieces of sponge. Now this is, while the mitomycin C is sitting there for three minutes, I'll cut the scleral flap. So here I'm cutting the outline of the scleral flap. And I try and aim for about one half scleral thickness. Now, if the scleral flap is too thin, especially uh, as you cut the ostomy later on, it may be easy to make a hole in that flap directly over the ostomy in the anterior chamber. And then you create a full thickness 
sclerostomy and the pressure may go too low. So it's important, I think, to make sure that the scleral flap is not too thin, but anywhere from about one third thickness to about one half thickness seems to be ideal. You don't want to go too deeply with your cutting, otherwise you may hit the choroid and you don't want that. So this is my preferred size of flap. And I, you can do triangular or rectangular, it really makes no difference, whatever you prefer. And I, when I cut, you'll see in the next video, I cut like a smile. So I'm using the blade, cutting the uh, lateral, the ed edges further forwards than, than the middle part. And this makes it easier to lift this portion and also to see where you're going. And at the very end, you'll be able to create a zone of clear cornea, which is exposed for you to be able to cut the ostomy. So this is cutting the scleral flap. One of the tricks is to pull up quite hard on the flap with, those, with your forceps, and then basically simply sweep with the knife. So you can see I'm catching up now on the other side. My assistant is wiping with a sponge to keep the field clear for me. And I'm cutting at the edges there to create a type of smile as I sweep back and forth and go forwards. Here I'm just venturing into cornea and limbus. And I'm going to go further forwards just so I'm well into clear cornea. This particular patient had very unusual iris. So I'm going further forwards than I would normally do to make sure that I'm away from the iris junction. And now I'm just checking, that's a little trick I use where I put the blade in at the end and I can just check that the incision has gone well onto clear cornea there where the blade is sort of pushing. Now I'll cut a paracentesis and here I've got a diamond knife, but usually I would use a plain 15 degree blade. I wouldn't use a diamond knife. Now here I'm using a 15 degree blade to cut the incision through the cornea. And I try and position that blade reasonably vertically. And because I'm right-handed, I run it from right to left so I can see the cut as I go. If I go the other way, I can't see the cut. And so I have the blade going, pointing in the left-hand direction. When you enter the eye and, and cut, make sure you enter deep enough so that you see, see aqueous humor coming out and then simply run the blade along and it will open up beautifully. So you've got your incision here and then you want to chop out a couple of little bites, which you can do either with Van Ass scissors and the knife or with a, something like a Kelly punch, which is what I'm using here. So we engage that wound and then cut that bit out, get rid of that tissue and then have another bite and that's quite easy there. When you're now, <clears throat> if you don't, I might play that again. If you've made your incision too close to the limbus, when you bite back, there's a tendency to bite into the ciliary body and then you'll get a big high femur and a lot of hemorrhaging, which again, you don't want. So it's one advantage of going further forwards into the clear cornea it's also one thing I try and teach our registrars to do because they have a tendency to not cut the flap far enough forwards. And when they bite back with the Kelly punch, they often bite into the ciliary body and cause a problem. So I'm quite, um, I would call it neurotic or persistent about that point, about uh, having that incision in the clear cornea and, and having absolute control over the punch or your scissors when you cut backwards to cut the ostomy. So now you've got the ostomy, you need to cut an iridectomy. You need an assistant to hold the scleral flap. So I'm grabbing the iris and here I cut the iris with some small spring scissors. I don't pull too hard on the iris because you can tear the iris root and then uh, damage it. So just a little bit of pull, pull on the iris. Um, now here, I'm going to suture the scleral flap with 
tenno vicryl, or you can use tenno nylon. I use vicryl because it dissolves and then you never have to worry about it poking through. So that's the central incision in the flap, uh, the central stitch, sorry, in the flap. And then here, this is one of the stitches. Uh, and I always put a continuous in the position that's away from 12 o'clock. So 12 o'clock ha happens to be here. I'm going to put a releasable in this part of the wound next so that if I have to pull it out, I'll try and encourage fluid to flow towards 12 o'clock. I don't want the bleb to go downwards so much because there it can create symptoms for the patient. So this is the releasable suture. And here I'm going kind of backwards, if you like. So now I'm going to pass it between the conjunctiva and the sclera, go through the corneal stroma and come out. Then I'm going to pass that needle backwards the same way. It's a little bit of a fiddle, but it is quite a useful stitch. Many people find this stitch easier if they've cut a fornix based flap. So if the incision is at the limbus, then you can see what you're doing more easily. So I'm pulling a loop out now. You saw me pull this loop out here. I'm going to tie the first end of the suture to that loop. So I'm, I miss the throw, I miss the loop. I've got to pull it out again. So I'm tied, tied again, and basically it becomes a slip knot. Oops, having trouble grasping there. Sorry about that. So anyway, I run three throws and then I pull on that loop and pull hard. And that basically becomes a releasable stitch. And there's a little surface of the cornea and you can simply pick that up with the forcep at the slit lamp and pull that out. And that will pull this entire knot out and will tend to lift up this flap. So then you get a little bit of extra flow if you need it in the first few weeks post-operatively. After about two weeks, uh, it will have started to scar down so it won't lift up. So it's only really usable in the first two weeks. So then you simply need to close the conjunctiva. And this is with, I tend to use ato vicryl here for this. Um, it's a standard closure. Uh, I'm fairly particular about making each pass quite tight because I don't want there to be any leaks or, and I want to reduce the risks of hypotony or low pressure. I, I don't want there to be very, very low pressure from a leak because the complications increase a lot if there is a leak. So this is just closing off the wound. And um, sorry, it's a bit boring watching somebody stitch. I'll just show you the final closure. Um, that's pretty much it. And then I just hydrate the paracentesis here. And these days I tend to give a depot steroid in the conjunct subconjunctivally, something like triamcinolone uh, just in case the patient's compliance with their drops post-operatively is poor. So I'll give that into the inferior fornix as well. So at the end of the surgery, you will have created this situation with a, a channel. You've cut a channel basically in the eye through the sclera so that the fluid can drain into the subconjunctival space. Now, just a few sort of uh, observations or questions you might have regarding trabeculectomy. There has been a lot of debate about whether you should cut a limbal or a fornix-based flap. 
And there was quite a nice paper published some years ago by a Chinese group doing a meta-analysis on all the studies that had looked at this question. And basically it doesn't really matter. So if, if you, the best evidence was in this set of results with complete success as their endpoint. And if anything, the evidence favored a limbal based flap slightly, but it did not really reach statistical significance. So um, basically it doesn't matter. It's essentially whatever you're most comfortable doing and whatever you feel is safest in your hands is what you should do. So don't let me persuade you into doing limbal base flaps if you're not comfortable doing them. So you should do what you think is right for you and your patients. Now, complications. What I fear most is patients having a very low pressure, sort of zero to two, getting large choroidal effusions, flat anterior chamber with the lens touching the cornea, or a maculopathy, a hypotenuse maculopathy, which is common in high myopes in particular. So there's a lot of studies looking at the risks of complications. This one by the Aegis, that was the advanced glaucoma intervention study from the uh, 1990s, uh, had a lot of data about, um, I think it was a thousand eyes all up who had surgery with complications. Um, I won't list them all for you. There's another study I'll show you which goes into them in more detail. This is an English study from 2002, John Salmon at Oxford looking at large numbers. So many subjects had high femur, about 25% or a quarter. About a quarter had shallow anterior chambers. Another quarter or the same quarter had hypotony or low pressure. About 17% had leaks. Now, most of these patients had uh, fornix based flaps, so they had limbal incisions, and they are more prone to leaking. And 14% had choroidal detachments or choroidal effusions, which is quite high, and I think that reflects the high rates of hypotony in this particular cohort or study. And again, I think that partly reflects the um, fornix based incision. Uh, late complications, cataract was the commonest. So it's quite common to get a cataract after a trabeculectomy. There's a specific reason for that in that you've basically, by cutting an iridectomy and having the big um, channel right there through the sclera, most of the aqueous humor is uh, rushing through the iridectomy and out through the sclera and not going anywhere near the lens. And so the lens is sitting in really a stagnant pool of aqueous, which isn't supplying it with nutrients and isn't carrying away all of the um, sort of metabolic rubbish that the lens cells produce. So I think that's why it's um, not uncommon to get cataracts more frequently after trabeculectomy. And then the other uh, less common uh, complications are an encapsulated or scarred uh, ring of steel type bleb, which I think is actually more common than 3%. And also infections, um, they quote 0.2% of infections, which is probably about right. Trabeculectomies don't seem to get that many infections. I think part of the reason is that if a bacteria gets into the eye at the time of surgery, it then is rushing out through your trabeculectomy channel out into the conjunctival where it's dealt with by, by the immune system. So uh, for some reason, uh, <clears throat> we don't tend to get that many infections with trabeculectomy, but we do get infections later on if the bleb is very ischemic and sick looking. We'll get onto that. So hypotony, uh, generally you have a flat anterior chamber, very low pressure, usually less than five. If you're unlucky, you'll have lens, corneal touch and large choroidal effusions. And here you can see this ultrasound scan of touching or kissing choroidals. And in that situation, you 
have to reform the anterior chamber and elevate the pressure. You don't want those choroidal effusions adhering to each other and leading to a retinal detachment. So now the commonest cause is a leak in the, con in the conjunctiva, particularly along the incision line. So uh, you, you must check the wound with fluorescein dye and do a Sardell test. And I usually check it twice, um, just be, almost certainly that's where it is. Uh, I, if a registrar rings me and says, the patient's had a trabeculectomy, pressure's very low, they've got choroidal effusions. I'll say, the first question is, is there a bleb? If there's no bleb, there's almost certainly a leak. And if they say that there's no leak, I ask them to look again and I'll ask them to look three times and put more fluorescein on and usually they'll say, oh yes, I can see a leak. So usually that's the answer. <clears throat> if the bleb is very large, then it's usually an overdraining situation and that you may need to go back in and tighten down. It could be that one of the stitches has come loose and that the flap is not tight and that's why you've got an overdraining bleb situation. So, uh, but if the bleb is large and the anterior chamber is still formed, the lens is not touching the cornea and the choroidal effusions are, are moderate, then it's fine to simply observe. And most times it will correct itself. So now some patients' vision will get worse after a trabeculectomy and this paper just looked at the reasons. This was that same paper from Oxford and cataract is the number one cause, about 65%. Progressive glaucoma still occurs, unfortunately, though usually at a slower rate. It's common to get refractive changes. Usually this is related to very early cataract. And I'll go into the more sinister and severe other complications now. The one that one of the ones I worry about is a central retinal vein occlusion. And in the setting of glaucoma surgery, where you've reduced the pressure very quickly, we call that a decompressive retinopathy, but it's basically a central retinal vein occlusion. And it's because the lamina cribrosa has been stretched out by the high pressure. When you lower the pressure suddenly, it relaxes a bit and then it allows the vein to collapse and, and constrict. And, and if it's, the vein is tending to be narrow beforehand and you don't know this, then it can block and cause a, an occlusion. Now that can be devastating and there's really no treatment for that. It's, it's simply very, very bad luck. Um, so what I do is preoperatively, if you have a patient who, most patients will have um, vein pulsation at the optic disc, most normal people, patients with severe glaucoma may not. So in those patients, they're more likely to get a vein occlusion. So sometimes I'll warn them that it's a possibility. Um, but fortunately, this complication is very rare I would probably see only one a year. Um, so, uh, Verna, you might, I don't know if you've seen many cases or any of you others, but it, it is, unfortunately, it's a very devastating complication when it does occur. Other serious complications, snuff out. So if the patient has severe glaucoma, a bit like this, with only a very small zone of field left, they're highly likely to lose that residual small amount of visual field um, might be a 5% risk. So I think they need to be warned. Um, now, the other problem after trabeculectomy is if the pressure is high. So if the pressure is greater than 10 in the first week, I will pull out the releasable stitch unless they're a high myope. If the pressure is greater than 10, what I do though, is I check with the gonioscope lens to see if there's any blood in the ostomy, blocking the ostomy. 
So if there's blood in the ostomy, then I will wait at least three days. And that, by that time, the blood should have dissolved and the blockage should have cleared. Now, if the pressure is more than 10 and I've waited the three days, and in fact, usually it'll be a lot higher if it's in the 20s or 30s, and there's still blood blocking the ostomy, then I have given tissue plasminogen activator into the anterior chamber to dissolve that blood. And that works very well. But again, it's very rare. I think in 20 years, I've only given it about five times. So that means about every four years, it might be necessary. So it's not very common. Um, if the pressure is more than 10, and it's more than seven days post-surgery, and there's no blockage to the ostomy, then unfortunately it's unlikely removing that releasable stitch will work. It might work in that second week, but after the second week, it's almost guaranteed that you'll have some scarring there and removing that releasable stitch won't work. So you will probably have to do a five fluorouracil needling and, and with the needle, try and get under the scleral flap and lift it up a little bit. We've already really talked about this. So in the acute situation, if the pressure is very low, the first question is, is there a bleb? And if there is a bleb, but there's no lens touch and no leak, then you can usually observe the patient. If, the, if there is a leak, then you have to close it. And usually that means taking them back to the theatre or putting a stitch in at the slit lamp. Now, if there is a bleb and there's no leak, then depends how severe the hypotony is. So it depends whether there's lens touching cornea or whether the choroidal effusions are very, very large. If they are, you might have to take them back to theatre and revise the scleral flap and tighten it down. You can try and sort of temporize or give a temporary treatment by giving an injection of a viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, which can work. So these are what I would call ideal blebs. They're diffuse, they're not too high, they are over a broad area, and they function usually very well for a long time. These are what I call more problematic blebs. You can see this one's very thin and there's a lot of scar tissue forming a dam or a ring, a so-called ring of steel right around it. So this is your classic insisted bleb. This one is just totally scarred over. You can see all of that white scar tissue there. This is another insisted bleb here. And this one is hard to see but it's also insisted there with a lot of scar tissue. And this one is a leaking bleb, so it's Seidel positive. So with the, the blebs that have got scar tissue, especially the insisted blebs, they will often respond to fifluorouracil needling. This is my technique here where in the root, the original papers that described 5-FU uh, needling simply gave a depot next to the bleb. But I think you can do more than that. What you can do is go in with the needle, give a depot, and then advance through into the bleb with the needle and cut like a little saw here, and then push the needle across the bleb and again cut like a little saw, go across the other side and give five fluorouracil on the other side. Now for the five fluorouracil to get out, it has to pass across the bleb and get out through the hole. And on its way, it's going to bind to the tissue of the bleb itself and have its effect. And that's really what you want. So I think if you're going to give five fluorouracil, and, you, and the pressure's too high and you need to break some of that scar tissue, then you should always try and give a depot of the 5-FU on the other side of the bleb so that it has to hang around for longer and it also has to have an effect on the bleb. 
but this is just an example. This is actually uh, giving a five fluorouracil injection just on one side of the bleb. So I didn't go right across, but you'll see where I've um, incised the edge of the bleb. This is the insisted bleb here. You'll see the needle going into the bleb. And the eye's moving a lot because the scar tissue was so thick, it was actually causing a lot of resistance. And now I'm actually trying to get across the other side, but I simply can't make it across the other side of this particular bleb. So I'm cutting as much of that scar tissue in this region as I can. Now these injections and needlings can be given years after the trabeculectomy if there is a bleb present and they will work often quite well. So it can save the patient having an, another operation. Now this, um, I'm just going to show you some success rate results. So this is from the um, AGIS study, again, the probability of failure in patients who've had the first trabeculectomy, a second trabeculectomy, or a third trabeculectomy. So if you have one or two trabeculectomies, at 10 years, about 70% will, will be still working in this study. Whereas if you've had two trabeculectomies already, um, only about 50% will be working. In fact, that's probably better than what we generally see. This is in a well-controlled, very Caucasian population in the United States. This is from a study done in the United Kingdom, and it looks at survival of trabeculectomy over 20 years. And you'll see if they've had no previous surgery, the 10 year survival is about 80%, which is pretty good. It's a very good result. But if you've had a cataract operation, your 10 year survival is only 35%, which is actually pretty bad. Your five year survival is only 45%. So quite high rates of failure in the first few years. And if you've had a previous trabeculectomy, the survival or success rates are almost as bad. Now you will notice if you've had previous intracapsular cataract surgery, so where there will have been vitreous loss or vitreous in the pupil zone, your success rate is even worse. Um, the other thing that came out of this study, the other observation, was that if you're on two or more different glaucoma medications before trabeculectomy, you are seven times more likely to fail. So patients who are on long-term anti-glaucoma drops are more likely to fail, especially if they're on two or more. Uh, now, the safest drop is probably Timolol, it seems to cause the least amount of inflammation, but pretty much all the other drops are rather bad news. The prostaglandins, alpha-2 agonists, the uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So, but then again, they're very effective mostly. So, it, but I just show you this slide to illustrate um, their effect on trabeculectomy success rates. So uh, what we noticed was that it seemed like 20 to 30 years ago, our trabeculectomies did better than they do now. And the reason for that is uh, most of our patients these days have had a cataract operation and most of them are on multiple drops. Whereas 20 or 30 years ago, there weren't the modern eye drops around. There was only Timolol and pilocarpine and so most of the drops, uh, the patients weren't on as many eye drops. So I think that's made a significant difference uh, adversely to our success rate. 
Now this, I won't labor this point, but it basically shows you that the pressures are more stable in patients who've had a trabeculectomy. So there's less fluctuation. This is a fluctuation in pressure post-operatively compared to pre-operatively. And this is quite a nice study done out of Europe looking at rates of visual field loss per year before trabeculectomy at about minus 0.4 decibels per year compared to minus 0.16 decibels per year after trabeculectomy. So um, on average, patients will still tend to lose some visual field, but much more slowly than if they had had trabeculectomy. And again, from another study looking at rates of visual field loss before and after trabeculectomy. So if you look at this rate of change before trabeculectomy, there are a lot of subjects who are in this bad group, which is faster than minus 0 0.5 decibels per year. But after trabeculectomy, most of those subjects have improved. That is their rate of loss is a lot slower. And this, I just colored that graph differently to help. So the green are the good group, even before surgery, who weren't progressing terribly rapidly. The red were the bad group, but you'll notice that most of the red group over here have now become green in the post trabeculectomy situation. So most of them have benefited. I won't actually belabor this point. This is basically saying that patients who've had a previous trabeculectomy will often fail. This is from the uh, a Japanese group, but it was also borne out in the trabeculectomy versus tube study, the TVT study. So the trabeculectomy group, this is probably risk of failing, but much more likely to fail having a second trabeculectomy compared to a, a uh, glaucoma drainage device or tube. Now the interesting figure is here where it looked at, so I just have to, tube group, trabeculectomy group. No, sorry, it's the next slide I'm pretty, no, that's it. There was one of these results looked at the previous trabeculectomy. Ah, yeah, sorry, it was this Japanese study looked at the outcomes where previous trabeculectomy was performed <coughs> uh, within five years. This is the dotted line compared to a trabeculectomy that was performed five years or longer. So this is when subjects have already had a trabeculectomy and that they need to have another one. What's their chances of doing well? Well, if the trabeculectomy, the previous trabeculectomy has lasted more than five years, this is this black solid line, they're much more likely to succeed for longer. Remember, this only goes out to three years here, but you can see that the ones who've had a trabeculectomy that's lasted less than five years are already failing at quite a high rate, 70% um, failure at two years, which is really quite a high rate of failure. So if a trabeculectomy has failed quite quickly, then there's really no point doing another one. I think you're better off doing a glaucoma drainage device. So I'm going to stop there. I think I've gone over time, Verna. Sorry about that. I, I ended up talking too much, as usual. Sorry. No, about that. No, thank you very much, Professor Morgan. Actually, there, there, there's already quite a lot of question here, Pro. In, oh, right. Yes. Uh, in Q&A, uh, there is seven. Uh, and also, there is one in the chat room. And then also, one doctor's have a question that is uh, uh, right to me, so I will I will say it later on. Uh, please, you could answer yes. in the question and answer first. 
a oh, question and answer. Sorry, I've got that yes. here. Yes. So, um, so I'll go through. Uh, yeah. Is there such a thing as too big PI? I always feel my PIs are too big. That's a good question. Um, no, I don't think there is such a thing as too big, although if they're very big, they can have an optical effect where patients get a slight double vision effect. So I try not to make mine too big, um, but it's quite, I find it somewhat unpredictable. You can't always guarantee what size they're going to be. Um, I, I think it's one of those things you don't need to worry too much about, um, but I, I think if they're very, very large, I just feel a bit embarrassed whenever I see that patient at the slit lamp. But funnily enough, those patients don't seem to complain. So it doesn't seem to matter too much. Yeah. So it's okay, Prof, with a big PI, right? I think it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but the, the next question in patients with IOP more than 35, especially 40, even with maximal medical therapy, can we change the step? Paracentesis before conjunctival peritony. I mean, what is mid, the when the trabeculectomy uh, so. Yes. so I think the question is really, should we lower the pressure first before we mm -hmm. do the rest of the operation? Is that correct? Yes, yes, like that, bro. Yes. Yeah. I Look, uh, personally, I would not do that. It's because when you come to cut the scleral flap, if the eye pressure is already quite low, then it's much more difficult to do that. And it's a lot easier to cut the scleral flap and also do the ostomy um, in a situation where the, um, the eye is firm and hard. So, and I don't think it makes any difference to the rate of complications. It's only a matter of a few minutes really between if you, do the paracentesis at the start of the operation compared to doing it in the middle part of the operation. Will the complication be higher, Prof, if the IOP is higher, Prof? No, I don't think so. Okay. Because you're either way, you're lowering the pressure very suddenly. It's that yes. sudden, sudden dramatic, uh, sort of the pressure's high and then you do your paracentesis and it goes chunk down. And it doesn't matter if that's occurring at the beginning of the operation or in the middle. If the patient's going to get a complication, they'll get it anyway. I so. see. Will it, uh, will it uh, help if we like making the paracentesis like slowly, Prof, during the trabeculectomy to lower the IOP, the very high, the very mm -hmm. high IOP? Uh, I, yeah, my, I remember people debating this about 30 years ago. Yes. I, no, basically, no one knows. I, mm. uh, I mean, I think if you can do your paracentesis gently, um, but I wouldn't, I don't think you want to take five minutes over doing a paracentesis. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't think it'd make much difference, really. Okay, bro. Thank you. The problem is, trabeculectomy, I call it, it's an operation looking for a complication. So when you do have a complication, you immediately think about all the things you've done in that operation that could possibly have aggravated or caused it, most of which have got nothing to do with the complication. It's just the nature of a very, that, that patient's eye, the pressure is built up gradually, probably over a long time, over years. Mm -hmm. And then the very nature of the operation is to suddenly reduce the pressure so it's a bit like bringing an aeroplane in to crash land virtually. That's, that's the nature of the operation, unfortunately. Mm. Thank you, Prof. The third question, Prof. Um, thank you, Prof Morgan, for your presentation. I would like to ask about what consideration we should make to decide on whether to choose limbal-based, fornix-based flap for beginner surgeon. Second question is how to ensure that the conjunctival flap sufficiently watertight after it's been stitched. Yeah. So again, it doesn't, I don't think it matters whether it's limbal based, fornix based. I mean, it'll partly depend on how you've been taught and what you're comfortable doing. Uh, I just happen to have a preference for limbal based, but I think the majority of surgeons actually do a fornix based flap. Uh, when you do a fornix based flap, then 
you probably do have to be even more careful about the closure. Um, and that when I, sometimes I do a fornix space flap and I do a fairly tight continuous suture with the Vicryl or occasionally with nylon. Um, and you can, when you, I didn't show this in the video, but when you inflate the eye, usually a bleb will form and then you can see if the bleb is leaking at the time. Now, it is acceptable to have a small leak, but as long as a bleb forms and the rate of leakage is fairly slow and the bleb is not collapsing, that's usually okay. Um, second question is, how do we ensure a conjunctival flap is watertight? Well, again, that's forming a bleb uh, by inflating the eye and looking at it, but uh, to see if you're getting much leakage. Um, the other thing is simply looking at the closure, seeing if the wound is, is closed tightly. Apart from that, it's just practice and experience, really. Prof, sometimes we use like a better uh, pofidon iodine to test the, ah. the lepra, sometimes. Is oh, okay. it? Do you perform that as well? Uh, no, I don't. But I think, see, because I do a limbal base flap, I don't really need to because I've got tenons up against. You'll notice when I closed, I, it's basically in layers. I close for the conjunctiva, then tenons, and mm. tenons conjunctiva. And so pulling that, those two structures together quite tightly. I can, mm. I've done it so much, I can tell if it's likely to leak. And if it looks like it's not tight, I'll just run a second run of stitch back and close over where it looks a little bit weak. But that's more difficult at a limbal incision because you can't really run back and forth like you can across a, um, a, uh, an incision that's far back in the conjunctiva. Also at the limbus, you don't have tenons as well, which helps to um, plug the holes, if you like. <laughs> That's why you get more leakage at the limbus. Yes, really. uh, so, the yeah. So, yeah, is there still indication of trabeculectomy to 57 year old woman, one eye, one eye blind with glaucoma, fellow eye suffered from advanced glaucoma, cup dysgratia 0.8, IOP is, is uncontrolled. Uh, yes, there is. I think you probably have to, but you do have to explain the risks to the patient because they've only got one eye. Um, but by and large, I think you're forced to do the trabeculectomy um, if they're maximally treated and the pressure's uncontrolled. Uh, but it depends. I mean, the patient has to consent and they have to understand that there are risks involved. Would that be your answer, Verna? I don't Yes, yes, bro. Me mm. too. Because if there isn't any other choices because of the uncontrolled with medication, then I will yeah. perform the surgery. But we have to explain to the patient, right, bro? Regarding yeah. the wipe out, something like that, probably. Yes, 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 very much. Uh, next question is, I, if the pressure post-operation before seven days is higher than IOP before operation, but the bleb is flat, there is no releasable suture nor leak. What do you think is the cause? What, sh what should we do next? Yes, yeah, so this happens sometimes. <clears throat> and I think often the cause is fibrin, which is sort of glued up the scleral flap. Mm. Uh, and sometimes <laughs> I've uh, stitched the flap down and it's, it's stitched in so perfectly uh, that it's like a jigsaw piece. Mm. I've noticed this. And then the pressure's gone high earlier on. And I think it's because the flap is so well sort of locked in there. And then some fibrin has stitched it up. So I've done basically had to do five fluorouracil needling and get the five a few needles. So I use a 26 gauge needle, come in from the side uh, under the conjunctiva go under the flap and then basically lift it up and usually will break one of those stitches. So cut one of those anchoring stitches at the, at the corner of the flap and then lift the flap up. And then that usually solves the problem. Um, 
I think I've had to revise one patient like that in theatre, take them back to the operating theatre and revise it, but usually you can fix it with a five fluorouracil needling. I see. Is that what, yeah. Like that. Prof, do you uh, usually, like, uh, when you do the needling, do you usually, like, uh, um, take the needle, go through the anterior chamber, Prof, or just in the flap? Just in the flap. I have done occasionally um, go through into the anterior chamber, but that <laughs> you want to make sure the patient's going to be very still for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have... Yeah, so I've occasionally seen um, uh, a blockage at the slit lamp on gonioscopy in the ostomy. So I've gone in with a needle, gone in deliberately into the anterior chamber. <laughs> but, the, but that's, uh, it, it's always scary, actually. I found it scary anyway. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Have you done it, Berta? Have you yes, done Rob. It? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. From Nisma, bro. Yeah, from Nisma. Uh, when is the right time to do bleb needling? And when do we need to do repeat five if you injections? Is there a minimum interval? Yeah. So I think we've talked about when to do five if you needling. Basically, if the bleb is flat, pressure's high, uh, and, uh, and there's no other reason apart from scarring or fibrin, then it's time to do needling and all so that's in the immediate post-op period in the late post-op period particularly when you get encystment of the bleb so that sort of ring of scar tissue forming around the bleb loculating it into a cyst then that's a, the other good time to do 5-FU needling and is there a minimum interval well I usually do the needling and get the patient to come back in either one week or two weeks time uh, if I'm really worried about it, it'll be three days. I haven't ever done it closer than three days again. Um, usually I wait at least one or two weeks if I have to do it again. Um, the main risk I find is 5 few toxicity to the cornea where you get epithelial breakdown and punctate epithelial erosion. So you should always look for that if the patient's had recent 5-FU injection and you're contemplating another one, because a second or third 5-FU injection will make that much worse. And I have seen an infectious keratitis develop in a patient, and I've seen some corneal melts as well in patients who've been given multiple 5-FU injections when they had some toxicity. So uh, if they have a lot of punctate epithelial erosions, I will not give them another 5-FU injection until those erosions have, have cleared, basically. Is there any, um, so the minimum interval for you is about one or two weeks, right? Yeah, well, or three days is the absolute minimum. The yeah. original, there was an original 5-fluorouracil study, which was published in the, I think it was early 1990s. Hmm. That was when that was before mitomycin C, and it looked at trabeculectomies where they were given 5 fluorouracil three times a week for, I think, three weeks. So they, each subject got about 10 injections, 9 or 10. It was a lot. And the time interval was only two to three days between injections. Um, but I found my, my patients wouldn't tolerate that, and it's... Uh, I don't know how they got away with the corneal toxicity, but that was the, the regime for that particular study. But no one else has published that type of study since. But it was a landmark study because it was the first one to use 5-fluorouracil in the setting, or actually any antimitotic, in the setting of glaucoma drainage surgery. So it was after that study that people began to use 5-fluorouracil and then I think it was only a few years later, the Japanese described mitomycin C. Oh, I see. Okay, bro. Uh, the next. Oh, we've got more questions. Um, I've heard about method of injecting mitomycin C at the beginning of surgery rather than soaked. Do you have experience in that? Uh, not with trabeculectomy. I do it routinely with a Zen uh, stent implant, <clears throat> uh, but I haven't done it with trabeculectomy. Uh, so I can't really comment. Uh, it look, it could well work. Um, 
you might want to be careful about the dosage. Mm. I've had problems in a couple of my patients with an in, initial dose I was using of 37 micrograms. Where I had a few patients get ischemic blebs and some stem cell changes at the limbus. So um, just be a bit careful of the dose you give, but theoretically, I don't, there may not be an issue um, with injecting mitomycin C. Um, I have heard that uh, there's, um, in the long term, mitomycin C could make like a, a, a blood leakage or the, I mean, the conjunctiva in the blood is not quite good, bro, in the long term? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it can make the blood go horrible, thin and pale and ischemic. And then they're more likely to get infectious blebitis. Um, and in fact, you probably want to be more careful in Indonesia because I think with the, in the tropics, you're more likely to get nastier bacteria. We, we're probably a little lucky in Perth. The climate's a little more forgiving for us. Um, but when mitomycin C first came out, there were, were reports of, I think, cumulative risks of infectious blebitis of 3% per year, which is actually a lot. That's a cumulative risk. Mm -hmm. But they were giving, at that time, moderately high doses of mitomycin C. Um, so I, um, I think whatever you do, if you are going to inject it, I'd start off with quite a low dose and then just get some experience and build up if you wanted to do it that way. Thank you, Prof. The next one, Prof? Oh, yeah. From what, should we do, what should we do if patient we plan for trabeculectomy but conjunctiva not healthy? Is that patient's had a pterygium? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Um, you, you basically look for another part of the eye. Is there a part of the eye that where the conjunctiva is healthier and go for that? Um, but there's, don't go inferiorly. That's bad news for trabeculectomies. But usually you'll find somewhere, but if it is very scarred, you may be best off actually going for a drainage device, a glaucoma drainage device. Werner, do you want to comment on that answer or yes. question? Yes, uh, usually if I have a bad conjunctiva, I will go straight to the to the GDD pool. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, you know that it will be, it will fail uh, quite quick, I think. Yes, yes. The yeah. scarring, etc. Because yeah. if you, you know that the graph, the, peri uh, the graph or the peritoneum is quite long usually, so it is a bit difficult to find a place in the in the half superior right prof yes so and these are these graphs taken from the superior conjunctiva yes prof usually oh. it, it is a, uh, in in my hospital usually the doctor take the conjunctival graph from the superior part i see so i wonder if it's, we we if we do pterygians we take it from the inferior conjunctiva oh in in part prof yeah, so that then we spare the superior conjunctiva if, oh. if they end up needing um, glaucoma surgery. I, I wonder if you can maybe talk to the um, pterygium surgeon about that. But um, yeah, that's Thank obviously, you. that's a big problem for you then. Yes, mm. yes. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> no, that's right. I'll, I'll let you have that conversation. <laughs> um, what and should we do? If the patient we planned for TRAB, but oh yeah, that was sorry. The, if we don't have mitomycin C or five, if you can, we still do the trabeculectomy. Uh, uh, yeah, well, that's a problem. Yes, the short answer is yes, you can, but unfortunately, the failure rate is going to be higher. But I think that's probably if that's all you can do, then that's all you can do, and the patients will still benefit somewhat from from it, but. If you can get five fluorouracil or mitomycin, uh, that's better. I don't know if one other manoeuvre you can try is giving a depot steroid subconjunctively at the end of surgeries. If you do, you have triamcinolone or kenicort or one of those long-acting steroids. 
uh, that you could give subconjunctivally, um, not right into the bleb, but close to the bleb um, after at the end of surgery. You could try that. Uh, I, I do that for my Zen patients, and that does seem to help. I use a very low dose of mitomycin C with the Zens, and I've been using um, triamcinolone, uh, and that seems to make some difference, but I haven't got results, measurement results on that yet. But that's probably the only other thing I could think of for you. Any? Can you freely get mitomycin C and 5 fluorouracil, Verna? Or is that in short? For, for mitomycin C, a bit difficult, Prof. We have oh. to, like, yeah, because the even we have to make a special request uh, from the hospital. Um, but for 5 fluorouracil, actually, it is easier, Prof. Right, right. So, actually, in many places in Indonesia, they, use, they could use the 5 fluorouracil, yeah. but for mitomycin C, it is uh, a bit difficult to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with the, this, the next part of the question is the maximum pressure. Um, can we do the trabeculectomy? How? Well, you can do it at any pressure. So I've done pressures of 60, for example. Um, but the risks do go up a bit at higher pressures. But then again, if you leave the patient at a pressure of 60, they'll go blind. So got no choice, really. Uh, we do give them, I mean, I'm sure you do the same, give them Diamox, um, Timolol, other drops, and also glycerol as well, um, pre, pre, preoperatively, to try and bring that pressure down more slowly in those people. Uh, the next question is about conjunctival compression sutures for overfiltering bleb. When should we be doing it? That's probably managing blebs is probably another talk almost. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so if they have large blebs that are very high, uh, then yes, compression sutures can certainly help. I've got a video of I don't. Fortunately, they're not very common. They probably only have to do one every few years. You might have to do them more often, Verna, because you do more surgery, but they, they certainly can help. Um, uh, that's my short answer, basically. Um, do you do many of those compression sutures, a Palmberg suture, Verna? Um, uh, I have done once. Uh, the, the surgery actually done by the registrar, right. and then the blood is quite high, and then the, IO, the, the anterior chamber is flat. So I just do one compression suture, Prof. And then next day, the, the chamber is uh, form a bit. And then in a week, it is uh, quite good, Prof. Right. Quite. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, very, very good. <laughs> um, yeah. The next part of the question is, how long should the sutures be in there before they're removed? Uh, I think every surgeon will have a different answer. I tend to leave them in for maybe a month and then remove them or two weeks, but it depends on your, um, how comfortable the patient is, whether there's any sign of infection around the sutures. Uh, but yeah, I've left them in for a month. I have used both silk and nylon as well. So the silk is kind of good because it's a big thick suture, uh, but it's more prone to causing uh, sort of stitch abscesses. The nylon is quite nice because it's easier to put in through the cornea. Whereas the silk, you don't want to put through the cornea, you want to put in at the limbus and then do the compression suture. So that depends really. I, I, don't, I don't do them enough to feel that I'm really an expert, I think is my problem. I never yeah. take out the compression suture, bro. You don't? Oh. No. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I take mine out. Oh, that's interesting. What suture do you use? The nylon, bro. Nylon, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and usually I just uh, just suture the flap, bro, through the conjunctiva, and then I just make like one or two suture in the flap, adding additional suture uh, through the conjunctiva and then to the uh, squirrel flap, and then tightening it. And then in the 
in the next week usually the nylon suture is actually like uh, getting under the conjunctiva. It's so I don't, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I don't have to take it out. And then the the blood is still quite firm, Prof. Maybe if I want to take it, I, I, have, I haven't uh, have an experience to take it out actually. Ah, because my, I think I'm, we're probably talking about two different sutures. My sutures are when the bleb is very extensive. Overhanging oh, and the Yeah, and also when, uh, so I'm not putting the stitch near the flap, but I'm usually going a clock hour away from the flap mm. and I'm using it to um, basically interrupt the bleb so that the bleb that's distal to the flap will shrink away because uh, it's not getting any fluid and the rest of the bleb will stay much the same. And then I wait a few weeks or a month and then take it out. But, um, I don't do enough. I think I probably only do one every three years or so. So I, I'm not really an expert to give that answer actually. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, the next, next week, after, after, trabec yeah, after trabeculectomy, until when can we do bleb massage? Is it safe to do bleb massage? Ah, is it safe to advise you? Look, uh, I don't actually do bleb massage. I don't really think it achieves very much. Because um, if the bleb is starting to scar or if the flap's starting to scar, then when you put pressure on the eye, you'll push some fluid out into the bleb, um, but then 90 minutes later, it will have reformed the eye. Pressure's probably gone back up again. Um, look, some people use massage. When we were doing massage, we didn't use it for, I think at least a week after surgery. Because if you do press on the eye hard straight after surgery, you can basically collapse the eye. You can the flap might open suddenly and then you get this rush of fluid into the bleb and then the eye goes very, very hypotenuse. Um, there's a risk of that happening. I've seen it happen once doing gonioscopy uh, with, a th with a three mirror uh, Goldman lens uh, using the gel, the suction, just the suction effect pulling the lens off the eye was enough to cause it to push fluid through the bleb and then um, the, the cornea to become all indented. Uh, that was many years ago. So these days, if I'm needing to do gonioscopy, I'll only ever use the four mirror lens without contact gel so that I can come off the eye easily without any suction. But I've digressed there. So massage, I don't tend to use anyway but I'd be careful in the first few days after the surgery. Uh, Verna, do you have a comment on that or? Um... Yes, Prof. Uh, yeah, sometimes I'm, I'm still doing that actually. The... Oh, right, right. No, that's fine. <laughs> it's only my opinion, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, bro. Maybe we should, yeah, we, we'll see whether it is. Sometimes I see that it is quite helpful for the patient, but. Uh, right. Then, then maybe, maybe, maybe it helps the flap sometimes lift up a yeah. little bit. Yeah, it's possible. Mm. <laughs> no, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, next question is now. Thank you, to Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. And now from Dante, I had a patient with a high bleb, low IOP, no leakage, and the lens touching the cornea. I did repair the bleb, but after that, the IOP tended to rise. Should I do needling? When is the perfect time to do needling in this situation? What do you think about using mitomycin C? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, Dante. So in that situation, you've had to reopen the wound to probably stitch down the flap. And just that extra surgery has stimulated more scarring. So then the bleb is in a sense, started to fail because of scar tissue and the pressure started to rise. But yeah, basically you have to go in and do 5-FU needling. Now, what, you, what I would do is not try and fiddle with the flap 
with the first needling because I'd be worried about sending the patient back into the first situation with an overdraining bleb and a low pressure. So I would just give a depot of 5-FU, go into, I'm assuming there is some bleb still there, but going into the bleb and needling a little bit and then seeing what happens, getting the patient back probably three days later or something like that, uh, depending on the pressure. And then if that hasn't worked, then be more aggressive about the needling. But I would just be a bit careful on how aggressive I was with the 5-FU needling, I think, in that situation. Um, now, you, you don't have to agree with what I'm saying here. I think if we had more time, we, this would be really a session on its own to talk yeah. about a lot of these things. So um, I'm just one person giving my own opinion. And I think some of you do many more trabeculectomies nowadays than I do. So um, I'm just simply giving you my, my own thoughts. I think this is the last question from questions. In a patient with an IOP of 26 on two glaucoma medications, and an encapsulated bleb one year post trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. Which do I do? Needling or five, with 5-FU five or a retrab or a Verna GDD? I would try the needling with 5-FU first. There's about a 50 to 60% chance that you can get that bleb going again with the needling. And you may need to do it, I will do it two or three times before I give up and then if I have to give up, given that the trabeculectomy was only a year ago and it's failed, I would then go straight to a GDD. Verna, what would be your, this is actually a very good question. Um, uh, Verna, what would be your answer in this situation? Uh, yes, Prof, usually I will try to do the needling and 5-FU first. And then if we, if I will see how is the condition of, uh, of the conjunctiva, Prof, if it is like, uh, going back to scarring, something something like that, I will just go straight to the GDD prof. Mm -hmm. But if I could see that the uh, conjunctiva is still good, I could ask the patient whether uh, the patient want to have retrabeculectomy prof. Right, right. Yeah. So it yeah. actually depends on the conjunctiva prof for yeah. me. Yeah. Prof, actually there is one question in the chat room prof. Oh, yes. Uh, from uh, is that, how, is that when, when you decide to do retrabeculectomy? Yes. Is that the one? Yes. How many times can we repeat bleb me? So I'm assuming you mean when do you decide to do a second trabeculectomy? Yes, trabeculectomy. Generally speaking, it follows that Japanese study. If the first trabeculectomy lasted a long time, as in five years or more then I think it's reasonable to do another trabeculectomy if the pressure is badly controlled. But if it's less than five years, I think you should consider doing a GDD. Uh, look, there's, it can shift it a bit either way, and it will depend on factors like the health of the conjunctiva and the underlying cause of the glaucoma, if it's uveitic or uh, eye syndrome, other issues. So, and it, so it depends on the fact, the type of glaucoma, the risks of a trabeculectomy succeeding at all, but also how long did that original trabeculectomy last for, would be my answer to that question. Prof, uh, one person asked to me uh, to ask to you uh, whether uh, you you are using mitomycin in the baby when you are doing the trabeculectomy. Uh, right. Yeah. Good question. Uh, no, I'm not actually using mitomycin, uh, but let me preface this. I haven't done any children's, actually the last children's operation I did was in Jakarta with you, a trabeculotomy. Oh. Yes. That was probably five years ago, I think, Verna. Yes, so I, I, this, the history is I used to do the children's surgery here in Perth, but then uh, Dr. Clark, um, who's with us at the Lions Eye Institute, did a special children's glaucoma fellowship in Canada and came back. And I was very happy to give him all of my children's patients <laughs> and sort of hand on the responsibility of looking after the children with glaucoma. 
And that was about eight years ago. So I haven't done any childhood trabeculectomies, well, or trabe rather trabeculotomies for um, at least eight years here in Perth. Uh, and the last one was actually in Jakarta five years ago. And I, I was always doing a trabeculotomy preferentially. This is for primary congenital uh, glaucoma. And I wasn't using any antimitotics at the time. Now, I don't know what, Verna, do you have a different practice there? Do you use an antimitotic in children or? At first, uh, the, my previous surgery, actually I didn't use mitomycin prop, but then later on I could see that the failure rate is a bit quite high prop in our population. So I try, uh, nowadays I'm trying to put uh, mitomycin C because I do the combined trabeculo trabeculectomy pro. Right, right. So, yeah, so that's why um, uh, I, 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 I use the mitomycin C and uh, we, we will see because it is yeah. like uh, my learning curve maybe for the children bro for the yeah. mitomycin C. What, what I found, this is only my personal experience, yeah. and also bear in mind most of our patients here are Caucasian, so it's like probably a different healing category as well, yeah. was that the children with primary congenital glaucoma who were six months old or less, so younger, usually did well with a trabeculotomy or even a trabeculectomy with no antimitotics. Between six and 12 months of age, they generally did pretty well, but there was starting to be a higher rate of failure. After 12 months, so after a year, they almost all failed. And that I would tend to just go straight for a GED. Uh, and that was for the primary congenital glaucomas. For the secondary glaucomas in children, they all, in my experience, they always need a GED. Yeah. I, if, I tr if I tried a trabeculectomy or a trabeculotomy, they always failed. So I, I gave up even trying, actually. So with, with your patients, were they patients who were less than six months of age? Or do you remember the age group that they were? Yeah, uh, sometimes, yeah, I could see that uh, because there is not, not so many patients with uh, prima primary congenital glaucoma pro in our mm -hmm. hospital, not so many. like. Uh, we yeah we do uh, surgery for prim primary congenital glaucoma maybe like one in a month. Oh, so, that's still a lot. That's quite a lot. A lot. <laughs> we would only do two a year actually when I was doing it. Yeah. Not very many. It's like maybe one a month, uh, prof, at mm. least. Uh, and then the rate, uh, the range of the age is quite. Um, you you know sometimes the the family bring the children like in the late stage so more than six months uh, sometimes they are early but it is quite uh, low in the number so you see that uh, facing with the quite uh, failure of the surgery then i'm trying now with the mitomycin c actually to adding yeah. yeah i'm thinking whether it will help but i don't know i i still have to um, and then to follow up these patients and then do the analysis whether it will be benefit for the patient or not, actually. Yeah, what, what I found was that the, the ones who did well, generally the bleb formed for a while and then it, it flattened out so that I couldn't see a bleb, Let's but the pressure, was, the pressure was still very well controlled. Mm. And I think it was almost as if aqueous veins were reforming into the area of the trabeculectomy and so there was no bleb. So I think the fundamental physiology is quite different in the primary congenital glaucoma, the young primary congenital glaucomas, but I don't have enough numbers or evidence to really prove that. So it, it would be interesting to see whether the antimitotics make a difference. And I, I haven't checked on the literature. I don't know if you've checked literature to see if that's the case. Mm, I think I have read from one of the literature regarding this prof uh, because uh, some of them say that the mitomycin C is not as um, uh, scary at, 
used to to be i don't know yeah. i i am I'm, I'm still uh, try to learn as well for for these cases actually <laughs> so i want to see i will do the follow up first and then i will tell you what is the result <laughs> okay good good, good. prof there's a uh, two page uh, two attendees raise the hand may oh, yeah. may i give them to us try to you yes absolutely okay uh, Dr. Sri Juliati, do you want to ask? And Dr. Yulia and Dr. Feli? Dr. Feli is... Because three of, uh, three of them is actually raising the hand. Do you want to ask? I think they're muted. You might have to unmute yourself. Um, yeah. It looks like they're muted. Or maybe... Unless they can type in a question. That goes, <laughs> yes. might be easier. Uh, Vera, actually, want to... Hi, Vera. <laughs> You don't want to ask. Where's uh, how can we get um, unmute? Yeah, we have to ask to unmute, Prof. Are you able to do that, or should I? No, we, I, I could just ask to unmute. So the attendee actually has to unmute themselves. Ah, right, right. Vera, can you unmute, unmute yourself? Can you hit yes. the? Yes. Hi, Professor oh, hi. Morgan. Yes. Hello. Yes. Oh. So nice this, to hear your lecture today. Yes. Uh, my question. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, in this area of uh, mix, do you still do trabeclectomy that often, Prof? <laughs> no, or I don't. Do Not very often. Do huh? <laughs> Not very often. Uh, I'm using. I'm using a lot of Zen. The uh, yeah. Jealous yeah. So yeah, so I've heard I heard from, from Dante that uh, now you prefer to do Zen implant, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, but but you, I, huh? I think I should explain that I'm one of the inventors, so I've got a bias there. Um, so I I still do the occasional trabeculectomy, and it's still a good operation. I did one the other day on a lady who had a failed Zen, actually. So the Zens do fail, and sometimes we have to do a trabeculectomy. Um, and also, the thing about trabeculectomy, it's got a, it's been well studied for 20 years, or what, I mean, it's been done since the 1970s. So it's got a, a proven track record, whereas none of the MIGs, including the Zen, have got a proven track record. We've got some data on our earlier Z uh, stents from 10 years ago, but the newer stents are different. So, I, uh, look, while I, I do like the Zens, I'm not game enough to say that they're as good as a trabeculectomy yet. Um, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> uh, but they are less problematic than a trabeculectomy. A trabeculectomy, certainly, you expect to get some complications. And I have to say, doing the Zen. It's, it's, it's more pleasant. You don't get nearly as many complications. But then again, perhaps the payoff is going to be that they won't last as long. So you probably should ask me that in another five years, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Prof. No worries. Yeah. I might be retired in five years. That's the thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, I think uh, one of the... One of our problem actually, like uh, having a Zen or something like micro sun, something like that, is actually because of the price. It yes. is even more expensive compared to the GDD that I have and that yes. we have. So uh, that's why uh, trabeculectomy is actually still one of the um, surgery that actually our choice is prof because of that. Uh, I yeah. don't know if there is later on, we have like a cheaper Zen maybe, Prof, or <laughs> then we will see whether the type of surgery will be changing. 
but uh, with the condition like like this now maybe only like uh, the person or a patient who is afford to buy that then we could do the the mix like zen but i don't think for the other type of mix is uh, have a superiority compared to trabeculectomy if we deal with the lowering the iop right no i don't think well the things like the eye stent or the trabecular bypass procedures won't give you much pressure reduction yeah, I know. Uh, and also their data only really goes out to about two years or maybe three years. So it's even less than the Zen. So I, I wouldn't recommend those. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't do them myself. I don't, but I've got my own biases, you see. So yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, they could from, the, from their, their study actually, Prof, because the IOP, like maybe only reduction is not that. It's not that much, is it, yeah, when you yeah, see the publications? Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, Prof, I think we have all of the attendee question answered, being answered by you. Uh, and we have like about um, almost even two hours, Prof. Maybe next 20, 12 minutes will be two hours. <laughs> all right, it's been long. I'm sorry to keep you, everyone up. I hope you've all had dinner or something to eat. You haven't? Oh, no, I hope you have. Oh, yeah. I have. Uh, I have. <laughs> I, don't, I don't eat dinner, you know. <laughs> so. I, I just wanted to say, I hope you're all well. And we are thinking of you in Indonesia. Um, so stay well. I'm hoping, well, I don't know when I'll come back to Indonesia, but I want to come back one day when the, the COVID situation is better. Mm. It's very nice to have you here, actually doing the surgery and also doing the research. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we could we could do more collaboration later on. And yes. I think uh, is Diela or Mita want to uh, say something? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Prof, for your lecture. Yeah, it is, uh, yeah, so enriching our knowledge because yeah, we have so many trabeculectomy here in Indonesia. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Prof. My pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have thank a good you. good evening. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Prof. I, I, I have a make a screen capture and I will uh, send it to you. Mita, oh, great. Mita want to say something, Mita? No? I think the volume. I don't know. I can hear your voice, Mit. <laughs> okay, Prof, maybe the problem with the device. Thank you very oh. much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Berna. Thank you, everyone, and the Indonesian Glaucoma Society. Thank you very much. Tomorrow, right. tomorrow we will have the meeting. Thank you. Yes, that would be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Terima kasih banyak semuanya. Terima kasih banyak. Mudah-mudahan kita bisa bertemu lagi pada sesi diskusi berikutnya, kuliah berikutnya yang ingin berkenan hadir. Uh, saya akan akhiri pertemuan kita uh, kuliah hari ini. Mudah-mudahan.